All right, welcome everybody to the uh, to the colloquium. I uh, appreciate you all being here, and uh, it's really a pleasure to introduce you know one of our colleagues from from Argonne, uh, who we love to get down to campus uh, whenever we can. Uh, and uh, Christina Negri, our speaker today, she's the director of the Environmental Science Division at Argonne National Laboratory. She oversees environmental research there, and she has a wide range of interest in that um, in that sphere, which includes environmental sciences, climate sciences, ecology, and more. She's been in Argonne for, for 30 years, and she's conducted or directed a, a lab to, to full-scale environmental, uh, a, a lab on full-scale uh, environmental remediation and stewardship. Um, she researched sustainable technologies for environmental improvement of urban agricultural processes. And she's currently, leading us to the topic for today, she's currently the lead investigator for Crocus, which is an urban integrated field laboratory for community research for client and urban science. I always get Crocus wrong. Community research on climate and urban science, uh, which is aiming to understand the relationship between climate change and environmental justice in the Chicago region right here. And I know that uh, she and her colleagues are interested in having collaborations uh, with uh, folks here uh, on campus as well. So uh, we're really excited to hear about the project and your work and ways to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you, everyone uh, who is here. Um, again, I'm Christina Negri, and I really wanted to uh, speak with you about our work in understanding the relationship between climate and, uh, and urban systems. I want to start with some introductions here. I'm not alone here in the Crocus team. There are several of us here and online. So Alko Tamati is there. He's the Crocus Science Director. Uh, he's a climate scientist. Um, and uh, and he's leading the, the scientific efforts and, and coordination. Scott Hollis, I think, is online. and He is leading the observations and data uh, development. Max Berkelhammer, where are you here, is, the, uh, is a partner, our partner at UIC, University of Illinois at Chicago, um, and he is the lead for biogeochemistry. And Ashish Sharma, who is also online, is, um, uh, is uh, at DPI uh, and Argonne with joint appointment. He's really kind of coordinating and leading the modeling part together uh, with Rob. Robin Wheeler-Grange, I'm not sure if she's there. She is uh, from Argonne and she is our community engagement director. Uh, oh, Chick Mekel is here. Sorry, I didn't put you in. Chick Mekel is here. He, sorry, I <laughs> I didn't. Uh, and so Chick is is also is leading the decision um, modeling, this decision uh, agent based decision modeling, uh, part of our process of our project. Um, we are here because the university has committed uh, to supporting a collaborative effort with Crocus, and hence we are here to find ways to make it happen and. And, and really engage with, uh, with those of you who are interested in, uh, in, in the science. Uh, I will start saying this is a, an, an, it's a new way of, of doing science. This is, project is funded by the Office of Science, the Department of Energy Office of Science. As you know, the Department of Energy is a mission-driven organization, so it's really focused on really addressing, in this particular case, um, the relationship and understanding how climate and energy systems can, can you know, interact with each other, in particular on urban systems. So the goals of these, uh, so it has funded these urban integrated field laboratories where really the focus is really to integrate between the physical systems and the human systems, to integrate the physical system from the bedrock to the atmosphere and, um, and really human people working with scientists. So it's a lot of integration in there. And the goals are really to understand the natural and human drivers and effects of environmental change in an urban area. Um, and uh, and for so this is a fundamental science effort, fundamental physical science effort. But it has to prove um, in line with the uh, administration's goals and and the and the and the interest, uh, really to to eventually provide the science basis to provide sustainable, resilient, and equitable solutions in urban system with special attention to underserved communities. So the linkages between climate science, uh, the, the physical parts of climate, and when it comes down to people, what does it do? And how does it, uh, how can we do it better so that we address some major uh, environmental and, and climate justice issues that happen in, and that there are part of our human fabric. There's four of these integrated field laboratories. We are one uh, in, uh, focused on Chicago. We are the only one that's led by a national lab. There are three more. One is led by University of Texas at Austin. 
focused in, in Texas, for, on Texas. There's one on Baltimore focused, um, led by Johns Hopkins. And the other one is the Arizona State University is leading the Southwest Corridor uh, Urban Integrated Lab. So I'll focus on Chicago. And I'll just say first that it's a large partnership. This is a $25 million project. Um, and it's, yeah, and, and there's four, uh, 18 organizations in there. So there's a tremendous collaborative effort coming in. You'll see a lot of organizations and research uh, R1 institutions in the Chicago area, a lot of minority serving institutions, one historic black college, college and university. This is specifically requested by the funding opportunity announcement to facilitate the generation of, um, of knowledge and, and really bringing the new workforce from minority serving institutions to diversify uh, future climate workers. Uh, we also have four community partners in there um, and I'll talk more about their role in here. But you see, it's a big group and everybody's doing their part is a, a large collaborative effort here uh, over five years. Uh, and we are year one into the five years of the project. So we are really starting to, to start getting to initial get data, but we have a lot more to do to, to shape this. Uh, what are we trying to do different in this particular case is that usually scientists, physical scientists, really have concerns about the, the blue boxes. You know, we have refined scientific questions, uh, we work on them, we do observations, we model, we integrate the two, and we come up with our science. In this particular case, what we need to do is that take all our specific science questions but filter them through uh, inclusivity and pertinence to a particular set of communities, which are the ones that are working with us in this particular case. And so working with them through working on existing documents, having meetings, uh, discussing their issues with them, thinking about the just energy transition, making sure that if we go toward the decarbonized future, we include everyone in this. We are really taking all this input and really select and filter our science question, and then we refine them so that they're really pertinent for this for this connection. And at the end of the story, you will provide you the results that are really inclusive and really pertinent to the to, to all sorts of community, including the most disadvantaged ones. And in doing that, we have uh, education and workforce development in there as, as an integral part of, of our, of our uh, project. So when you see the science goals, as I mentioned in the previous slide, what do they translate to eventually when we are done? In having what is the closest version possible of an urban digital twin for, for really understanding how do you address climate at the very granular level in the city and using uh, scientifically advanced tools to do that, which is a tremendous step forward compared to what is present now. And obviously look at the societal benefits, sustainable, resilient, equitable solutions for all. And uh, being this is a fundamental science, what we are really looking at, not only at delivering a reliable representation of the complexity of climate and, and city of Chicago and the Chicago region, but also create tools that are really applicable elsewhere. You know, we presented that the United Nations um, uh, Habitat Assembly, I was there with Nico, <laughs> um, and, uh, and that was a stark reminder that, that vulnerability to climate change affects a lot of people, up to 3.3 billion of um, United Nations words, and each one may be different. And so uh, thinking science, thinking globally, but then zeroing in on, on, on localizing the, the, the integration, the, the impact, it, the addressing the issues uh, to the level of each community. And so really, really thinking advanced decision, making tools and advanced tools and frameworks to ev evaluate how climate and cities go together. In Chicago in particular, uh, you live here, so you know all, um, a lot about this, but Chicago is really high in inequality among, um, among the nation's larger cities. And, and you see here just a, a depiction of heat vulnerability index taken from the combination of roof, temp roof temperatures in AC consumption. This is work from uh, one of our collaborators, Ashish Sharma, who actually looked at, at the fact that the people who are more uh, there are, that suffer the highest temperatures are also the ones that have least availability to air conditioning and hence are the most vulnerable to heat. And so this is what prior to our, our starting the work, what we want to do is refine this further so that you can be really, really totally quantitative about issues like these. And so the communities in there that we have worked with are really concerned about all these different things. And you can see here, they, they stem from very physical one, flooding and heat, to housing, to eventually things that involve and engage the socioeconomic and you know, world that, that, that you represent here in Mansueta and University of Chicago, including gentrification, including marginalization, including stress, including 
uh, deterioration of, of communities. And so that's why we're really seeking some of this collaboration because there, there's a lot to do and, and our communities are much more complex than just addressing a flooding issue. Uh, and going to the flooding issue, uh, to, to the communities, these are the, the four community uh, rep um, people, four community organizations that work with Krokos. One is really of regional interest. This is a Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. They have, they, they, it's, a, it's a gathering of some, some 200 uh, uh, municipalities in the region who are all developing their plans and they have actually a, uh, already developed a climate action plan, which we're gonna work very tightly with. The other three are community organizations. One is right here in their background in Portland, uh, Blacks in Green. One is the Greater Chatham Initiative. Chatham has the, the record for the highest number of flooding calls and, and, and uh, calls to 311 uh, in the city because when it rains, eventually the water makes it its way into Chatham. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the Puerto Rican Agenda uh, in Humboldt Park, who is really interested in a lot of issues that have to do from air quality to heat uh, to gentrification on that one, and particularly community self-determination. And so you have here a lot of uh, different kind of interest in the community we are trying to, uh, to incorporate in our, in our science question and in our, in our research. And when we talk about co-designing and quantifying the benefit of equitable climate solution, we really think of gathering uh, with the community and understanding what they prioritize and the biggest challenges they're facing developing this knowledge into a series of science questions and convert the science question to a rigorous process. We have expectations in there that may not be extractive, but really work with communities that have mutual interest, as well as the the slides, but really to have a, a faithful and a, 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 a respectful uh, discourse and, uh, and participation of the community, who is actually helping us identify the best places to observe uh, to put this, the finger on the actual problems as they happen at the scale of the neighborhood, um, as well as um, for us sounding our messages and, and really making sure that we make climate, climate, climate science and climate scientific topics understandable to a large uh, set of community outside of the research um, scientist community. So I think of it, and you know, there, there's a lot of discussion nowadays about fair science, uh, inclusive science, and particularly this is, has happened on AI, which is gonna be eventually powering a lot of our models and a lot of our tools. And so um, some of the work that we have really stems from some of Rao's attention on, on, on downscaling climate models. And so you see that, you know, what the solution that happens at the global level is not necessarily what you see at the, at the local level or the hyper-local level. So what we are trying to do is really zoom in from a larger and regional and local scale down to the hyper-local and then build back to the, the other way around, right? And, and if you think of it, this is really the way we are trying to do and why we need to be the hyper-local thing is really to make sure that our science and eventually our AI is, is equitable and inclusive. If we don't have the data that reflect these heterogeneities around the city, we won't really have said, could be able, we won't be able to say that we're really totally inclusive because we will always know that there are some data sets that are missing because people don't get representation. Um, <coughs> we don't have this specific data. Uh, so in, in practice, what Crocus is doing is really a combination, if you see to the left, uh, observing um, uh, and modeling a baseline, um, define future scenarios uh, with the help of the communities, and then really go back to our, our models and really analyze what these scenarios are gonna present as far as outcome. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by all those different things. And the, the major scopes uh, and, and purposes of one is to under, under improve the representation of, um, of urban system, systems into larger scale models. And so understand what, how cities contribute to the climate around them in the region. And the other way is how climate impacts the city in all its granularity and in all its dimensions. This is the area where we're working with. You can see it's a, it's a pretty broad area in there. We have a lot of partners in there who already have some boots on the ground in, in, the, in the communities in here. There's a lot of observational points and sensor networks and project sites in there that we are capitalizing upon. Um, and, and so we have been working this past year to develop a lot of data. So, so this, from now on, it's, it's not a comprehensive view of what Crocos does, but, but I would really like to give you examples of the type of data sets and the things we are trying to, 
to achieve over these years so you have a better idea of what opportunities for research and, and what kind of problems we may want to accept, uh, address. So the key piece here, um, particularly for the more fundamental physical research is really to go in with two prongs. One is modeling and the other one is observation. The two inform each other. So the more you have data that, that uh, reinforce your models or allow you to refine your models, the more the models will be able to tell you where to go observe and, and how to refine your observation. So it's, it's a loop in there. But there is a lot, and, and Scott Collis, who's I think online, will tell you a lot more about, about the observation system, but there are several levels of, of observations in there. One is existing data sets. There is tons of data in there if you go look for them. Uh, oftentimes they are scattered and they're really hard to put together. They're really difficult to connect with each other. They have different formats. Assembling them all into one, uh, in one repository really helps our, our research uh, tremendously. The second one is, um, is to have um, specific campaigns. We're gonna bring in uh, large instruments, particularly from two of our, our, our partners. One is the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The other one is University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. They're gonna bring truck mounted instrumentation and do very specific campaigns that are gonna look at, for example, atmospheric um, parameters across an urban canyon, for example, temperature, precipitation, air quality, uh, and additional more. Um, the other one is gonna be, um, are Micronet, and these are a, a suite of, and you can see them right there with nodes. Those are edge computing enabled nodes uh, that connect, collect, uh, that they're, uh, they're developed at Argonne and Northwestern um, that are able to manage instruments that are attached like a chandelier on, on them. They have all the porting and all that. So you have a variety of instruments that are attached to them. We have already deployed two. We're planning to go do a lot more for, for a total of 21, I think, across the, in the next couple of years. And, they're, they're at, uh, and they are deployed in very specific location to increment the, um, the scarcity of, of uh, EPA stations for that matter, or, or some official ways to, to measure components. The last one is, uh, is what we call um, community science or citizen science. Right? Um, our team is actually testing cheap uh, rain gauges, for example, or other weather stations that eventually when we know how they perform and know what biases they have compared to the goods, the, the, the expensive instrument, if you will, I can be deployed in schools, deployed with, with communities and, and other churches and other places to get even more granular um, understanding of what happens at the street scale. This is going to be accompanied by a, a suite of models that really go from uh, from the micro scale to the urban scale and the regional scale with a variety of different models. And Rao will tell you all about it uh, if you ask, but but basically the idea that each each model and each scale is paired with, with one particular way of, of observing and, and being validated. So there is a very complex system in there that, that, that allows everybody in the team to contribute their modeling expertise, their observational expertise and really process the data together. And they and both are I have to do with atmospheric parameters and biogeochemistry parameters. So we want to look at soils, plants, and, and everything living in the in the in the in the in the, in the sea. Uh, ultimately, then what we are going to do is look at solutions and uh, community-driven solutions and really examine what these type of solutions would uh, do to improve people's life. And, and well-being, um, as well as the climate impacts, right? As well as the reflections back to, and the feedbacks back to climate. Are we saving any CO2 emissions? Are we changing something in the reflectivity and the and exchanges of energy and moisture and everything else uh, in the ecosystem, in the environmental system? So we are going to, uh, to uh, going strong on nature-based solutions and, 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 and green things, but as well as really understanding what different kind of rooftops are, are on. <laughs> contribute and reach the transport in there. Um, so a little bit of the data that we have, a lot of work this year has been really gathered in understanding our, our land, uh, understanding where we are and, and getting to have some data on the heterogeneity. And when I talk about heterogeneity, this is collecting existing data, which we're gonna strengthen and, and, and work more in detail. But you can see already, this is um, particular matter, relative humidity and temperature at the street scale. So you can already see the patterns there where, where highways impact something or where 
you know, the lake, the lake effects could be more visible and so on. So that's one case, but one is the spatial variability. Another one is the digital elevation. So the, the, the 3D version, which is gonna be really important eventually when you have, get, get down to modeling what happens at the street scale and the, and the atmospheric uh, dynamics um, in there. So we're spent a lot of time doing, doing these and collecting ways to map the city, you know, in all whichever way, um, as well as, uh, uh, Max's team has been working on mapping tree canopy and its health. I should add that I will have a lot of example about trees and so on, because those are, are one of the solutions that all communities want. More trees, green infrastructure uh, is perceived to be better for the, for the city. We want to quantify how much better that is. So this is very important. Um, and so going to the hyperlocal model of observation, this is you know work from Rao's team is really looking at, at computational fluid dynamics pretty much to really understand not only what happens above the building, but inside the trenches, inside between buildings and, and really understand what people can live at the, at the street scale uh, as they walk um, along the, the, the curbside. So you can see going back to the discussion about all, the, all these building blocks, understanding heat and moisture fluxes, understand how trees change that. So we actually, one of our um, scientists actually um, scanned a tree using LIDAR technology and then developed the computational fluid dynamics around it that can tell you how the tree behaves and, and how the flows and turbulence around the tree is developing. What are we going to do that, with that is, uh, is doing something like this. We know how a tree uh, shades uh, during the day. <laughs> we know the exchange of, of air. We put in other model component and you can figure out here, this is a preliminary work, but it's really it re re relative to what we can do is really model um, what would happen to temperature and, and, uh, and water, water, pre uh, water vapor um, when you put some trees in. These are like three streets. So the H is like three streets in Humble Park. Right? and really and try to visualize and understand what would be the temperature changes when you put trees. And so the idea is here is to go back to the community and say, if you do this, this is what you would get, right? With all the things that go with it, with, with the fact that at night you may have more moisture and you may not feel that change in temperature that well because the perceived heat is, is gonna be different, right? What would you like? Would you want to put trees in a different co configuration? Less trees, more trees, uh, would be trees, um, on the streets or would it be better to have trees in, in, a, in the park or in other places? And, and having that conversation brings everybody in and, and, and tries to, to really develop what would be the optimal solution for this particular community. And then having the feedback once you integrate all of these you know, into the larger scale model. Uh, atmospheric observation, this is just an example. This is one of deployment. We were able actually to deploy before the, um, the Canadian wildfire struck. And so you can see this is on the rooftop of Northeastern Illinois University, which is on the Northwest side here in Chicago. This is a team assembling, <laughs> you can see Chicago in the horizon there, um, assembling one of our waggle nodes uh, in there with some instrumentation. And uh, we could actually easily see from that station uh, the impact of the Canadian wildfires on, on air quality. And so that was a uh, something that really got the community interest very, very quickly. And so uh, we only had one at the time, but but we were able to start already show the, the impact. And, and it was a tremendous learning experience for, for the students. So you can see there, this is um, uh, with this particular, particular matter in here, carbon monoxide, ozone, and nitrogen mm -hmm. dioxide. So going to the potential solutions, this is work from Max again. Um, you know, we talk about all about green infrastructure and what is good and what is bad and what can we do. Uh, the benefit of tree canopy on temperature, flooding, pollutions are highly dependent on where you are. That's another reason to localize, you know, the, 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 the action and localize the, our, our science uh, at that level. Uh, from his research, um, it's very different if you are Boston or Madison in here, you can see that the, the cutoff for which you really find, find an, an impact is very different in Madison from Boston. And that really say, prompted our questions, how, um, how can localized knowledge on green spaces, climate feedbacks, guide neighborhood scale decision-making? You know, do we know that? How, what, what makes a difference? Because one thing is assumed that the community is green and so it's good, but it may be, um, could be more than that to be quantitative. Uh, going still back into the bio, the biogeochemistry, the idea is eventually to really be have to have a full picture of the impacts on the environment, and so energy budgets, water budgets, carbon budgets, all they come together. 
together with the benefits to people and and the communities as well as as they um, as they uh, an assessment overall. So it really we are really trying to to create a, a large picture for for what we do and really have an all all of the above type of assessment at the end of the of the analysis. Uh, for example, is looking at land surface modeling. You can see here the effect of heat waves on carbon exchange and irrigation. And so you can actually decide what management structure and, and practices you can think of uh, if you have a lot of greens in order to make it happy, uh, make it functional and, and persistent in time, right? And so what we found here is the heat wave will decrease carbon capture rate, though uh, bo both trans photosynthetic declines and respiration increases due to warmer temperatures. So, so there are all these trade-offs that, that are already not apparent uh, very initially, but you, we really need to get uh, into uh, if we really want to be um, data-driven and science-driven in finding solutions and, and guiding our communities to, um, to select and push for the one that is, is the best for them. Again, urban vegetation and soil, I just don't want to be too late here. Um, again, um, looking at the dome of CO2 and the urban heat island and really understanding ultimately what the next next ecosystem exchange would do if you think about carbon capture and, and release of, of CO2 and, and, and all of those different pieces, right? Um, temper, another part that, that Rao's team has been working on is, is moving a little bit from purely green things to looking at different roofing strategies and looking at cool roofs the ones that have been painted white, refractive roofs, roofs, green roofs, and solar panel roofs, and looking at the um, the changes in temperature uh, during the daytime, as well as the energy consumption, to really understand what are the options in there. And again, here is another case where there is trade-offs. Right, you have <laughs> solar panel roofs behaving in a certain way, uh, and depending on what time of day you are, um, you may have a best benefit. Uh, but overall, uh, the, uh, the <laughs> the cool roofs are the one that are actually consuming uh, less um, overall. Um, with that, we don't consider in this particular case, the impact on water for green roofs, for example, you know, retaining precipitation and minimizing stormwater or other effect that could be there. So we are really still, you know, at the early phases in, um, in our work. Uh, regarding community and decision-making, uh, I mentioned here, that we are we are deep into really working with our community leaderships, and we're going to be going into the larger community soon, uh, as soon as we have our um, human subject research approved. Um, planning engagement, uh, really looking at um, we had actually several tools of the neighborhoods with scientists and community members together uh, to work on particular um, aspects of green infrastructure, for example, flooding concerns. Where is floods? Is it you know overland flow? Is it basement flooding? How does it happen? All the details. And the last one is really what I mentioned about, uh, about community science. And this is, was an engagement at the lab at Argonne with uh, a school. Uh, and they were really interested in hosting one of the, the cheap weather stations and, and, um, and um, rain gauge. And so there was a lot of um, explanation there of what the cheap uh, rain gauge is there, which is still the best standard for, for doing this type of work and how they could actually engage and reproduce that in their school and they could take care of it. And so, so there's a lot of engagement at different level. And, and one of the things that we also learn is that all these communities care deeply about their children. And so for them is just as equally important to reduce flooding as it is to provide their children with some new careers and new ways of making it in life. And so the idea of having students from those communities work with us and then be the speak, speak, speaker persons to their community telling what it is, it's a huge drive for, for us. And so we're really hoping that this, this work with, with, the, with the schools and, and with churches and all that will be a really tremendous bonus for us to, to keep engaging with the, with the community. Finally, this is Chick's work, uh, the impacts of decisions. Uh, it's really, uh, what it is, is really understanding um, what would be the impact of certain decisions made by agents. And so uh, Chick can tell you all more in, in more detail about his agent-based model. Um, but basically we have a synthetic population that is vetted with all the, um, uh, the demographic statistics and, and all the data, so it's realistic. It was actually developed for developing epidemiological um, support for during the pandemic. And so we have, Chick has been working on that. It has a concrete number of um, types of people and who are make up at, at the certain level. Um, and and what, what, what the team is doing is really integrating this agent-based decision model 
with the physical models, with WERF, in, uh, with the research forecast model, for example. Um, so that the two can work in a loop and, and based on certain outcomes from the decision-making process, then the, the, the physical model can kick in and, and say, if you do this, then this will be the consequences. All these parameters that we saw at bed, flooding, uh, temperatures, uh, all the other things. And so what he has been doing is really <coughs> been working on this, you know, uh, adapting this synthetic populations to the needs of not COVID, but um, climate uh, and really uh, putting it all together. We also received more specific data from community partners. So the census data and all this regular demographic has been augmented by all this information. And then now is really working through the decision to be made. And we are really now scratching the surface and try to get into deep into what kind of decision are we thinking about? Uh, what are we, um, saying, what are they this discriminant? How can we put a quantitative um, marker onto our decision so that we actually have something that realistic and it's testable in our models? So Chick can tell you a lot more about that, but this is where we, we are with that. But just, just, just to show that what we are doing at the, and on the physical sciences eventually has this, this deep connection with how people make decisions, how people, interact, how people want to live their lives and how they envision their future. And that's what really, I think should be, I was hoping would be the, the subject of more collaboration with Mansueto and, uh, and, and, and you all here. So um, I have a few uh, slides more. I deliberately kept it short to give room to dialogue and discussion and let my colleagues speak a little bit more. But when we conceived Crocus and we were in proposal writing phase, we really thought uh, of Crocus as a catalyst for an urban science ecosystem. Um, the, um, the Department of Energy doesn't necessarily fund um, things that don't have to do with energy uh, and, uh, and the environment. Um, so health, for example, uh, is not something that we can easily do in the sense that DOE stays in, in, its, in its lanes, health is NIH. And so we have those the partitioning. Nevertheless, there's the data we are gonna generate we argue are much more useful um, to a lot more people than, than the strict work we are doing. And all the data is expected to be open science, open open to everyone. And so the idea is really to expand on Crocus, really create an ecosystem where we really connect the, the Crocus data with people who are interested in looking at asthma effects, for example, asthma incidents at that granular scale, or looking at other, other things that we cannot even think now. And so the idea here is really to use the data sets, use the models to more than that they really initially conceived for. So that's kind of the basis that we developed, uh, for which we developed, we, we embedded in, in Crocus in itself. And, um, and so now with, with you, we are really seeking this collaborative research uh, in a different way, in a different set of ways. One is really to refine specific science questions. Um, these are the three science questions that are more related to the physical human continuum, if you will. One is, does inclusion of climate agent feedbacks into an earth system model lead to climate projections that can help assess inequity for individual or communities? Um, how do nature-based solution and other interventions address local urban heat island, flooding and other community concerns? And how can intervention achieve the most beneficial trade-offs for diverse communities? What are these trade-offs? How, how do people think about trade-offs? How do we, can we, we again, quantify those trade-offs and and insert them into a larger you know, analysis that, that goes from, from an individual community uh, or neighborhood into the whole city, for example, that complexity. Uh, and the last one is how com can participatory community-driven research integrate local knowledge with scientific processes to generate improved understanding of challenges, complexity, aspiration of urban residents. This is really something we've faced every time because the language of community is not necessarily the language of science. We have stories from the community, narratives, experiences. We have all this. How do we incorporate all this wealth of knowledge into our very cold, if you will, our very rigorous and very, very structured um, discourse in, in research? Is there a way that we can work with you to understand and make a case for how we incorporate all this into science in a scientific way, right? So that's, that's the kind of three things. Um, again, more broadly, to strengthen the linkage between physical science and social, economic, behavioral science. Um, as you can see, we're going to get really deep in the trenches of, of very highly detailed 
uh, <clears throat> data sets? How can we help and, and physical processes, understanding you know uh, the tree perform and all those different things? How do we put that into more connection with with the with the social and socioeconomic behavioral science? The other thing, as I mentioned already, is to use the data generated for collaborative research on other topics. That's always um, a really good thing, collaboration in general, to better understand the human drivers of decision. Basically, what we say is if people decide this, this will be the consequence, and we're good at doing that. But why people decide A versus B, pick A versus B, what drives that science, we would like to really understand. And then maybe this is something else that could be, could be of interest here. Uh, understanding more, you know, I don't know if it's a behavioral economics or, or some other disciplines, really understand us uh, to a better understand what's the driver behind some, some of these decisions that we're going to model. And then any other thing that came up to your mind. So, so this is really what I had. I think I have one more slide, which is questions. And so, uh, <laughs> uh, so that is, that is it. And we have about what, um, 20 minutes or so for, for top, for come, or questions, so, answers. Pretty flexible on the hard stop. If people need to go exactly after okay. an hour, they can. We yeah. can continue okay. the conversation. Sure. sure. Yes. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Julia Kapinski with the Center for Spatial Data Science. We're upstairs. Mm -hmm. So this is a very exciting project. It's clear from your presentation what the focus uh, the focus on education on understanding on community um, you also talked about solutions which is usually the realm of engineers or you know businesses or people who can then put that infrastructure in place that that communities decide on after understanding the problem mm -hmm. could you say a little bit more about how the people who would be responsible for putting the solutions in place fit with this picture um, so that, you know, in terms of moving the needle for communities, we can get a sense yes. of how that's going to happen. Yes. So, so actually, this is a, a really key question, I think, because uh, when we were working with communities, the question came about, what is in it for me from the side of communities, right? What is the, what is the, why should I even bother with this, right? And, and our particular challenge is this is a science project. This is fundamental science. The people who fund us are interested in the interaction between uh, atmosphere, uh, you know, in, with aerosols and clouds, right? And, and, and how that happens. So it's very distant from real people on the street. Uh, nevertheless, there's that intent. Um, so, so there are a couple of things that we, we worked on. And the idea is really we provide the data to make Pretty much inform uh, what would be the the uh, the outlook for particular solutions that are made there. Uh, but with that, we actually we uh, we are available for these communities to help them write proposals, for example, to to provide some information that they can actually do. We at the lab we cannot do policy at all, right? So so that would be something else that your team your your group could do attached to us. We cannot do it. We we are prohibited from doing that. But we can inform policymakers, right? We can say. This is what should, the, the technical outlook, the scientific outlook is this. So that is one thing. The other part is really when we go back to the decision-making models, uh, I have a very generic match here, but, but actually the, the thing that would be interested is to scale this. So it's not just people as people, but if, when you think aggregated choices, your municipality, your, 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 your department of street and sanitation, um, which ultimately is the city. The local thing, if you think the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, that's a perfect example of that because those are the mayors. They are the mayors of the communities around Chicago. And so we are actually going to have a completely different discourse with them than we're going to have with, with the Blacks and Green in, in Woodlock, right? Because they are they have a different level and different scale of thinking of that, which are the, they are the ones who are actually going to be implementing something. So if we tell the community members, hey, in order to uh, to address your chronic flooding issue, Trees are going to solve 20% of your problems. The rest is going to be because you need different pipes in different places. Then is that something that they can go and say, this is what science has told us, right? And so we can work with the mayors. We can work with the mayor, the, the, the city of Chicago, uh, CMAP, um, Metropolitan Mayor Carses is there. Um, various other entities are, are champions. So they we are working in, in, with them also to, to really make sure that what we do meets those needs. So, so we are trying to really address initial scale, you know, who scaling making decision, who makes decision for their own household, who makes the decision for their municipality or for their organization and and, and higher up, right? Oh. Sorry, can I follow up on that? Because I'm yeah. curious if there's an explicit plan for this after the science is done. 
you know, I can imagine that after engaging this community, getting them invested, and you're coming out with a plan, and then, then there's the, the plan isn't actually going to yes. uh, be be implemented. Could in fact be frustrating and, and uh, undermine yeah. some relations with the community. Is there a part of the project that's that's funded for after the science? Here's what we're going to do. No, there is not, uh, because this is again a fundamental science coming from the Office of Science, which is really cannot really get into anything, any any implementation thing. But uh, with that, what we are we are hopefully going to work in the background is work, for example, with the Applied Office of DOE, who are all about demonstrations of solar microgrids, um, other other technologies to say this community is ripe for this investment. They really want this in the next demonstration of the next future facility could go in here, right? Or for example, one of the uh, entities that are working that is, is one of our, our champions, if you will, is ComEd, right? And so they have repeatedly uh, expressed an interest in, in following what we do because it could actually inform some of their community decisions. And so um, our role with the community is also that of broker, if you will, it's a, it's a, it's a loose term, but, but basically putting people together so that some things can happen. So it's not an official mandate of Crocus, because we the funding is limited to what it is, but they what I was saying about thinking bigger about Crocus is really those kind of things, the kind of things that ultimately communities can actually say, we got something out of it, which is really high on our, on our agenda as well. Not to mention the fact that if if Comet wanted to put a, a microgrid, in, you know, and install it right now, we could actually follow the changes from before and after, and and really understand a, a lot better how that plays out, what the before and after situation, and, and get all of the science out of it. So, so we are trying to work in that way. It's not easy, uh, but that's the best. The option, the infrastructure reduction act, all the new legislation that came down. Um, are going to facilitate um, some of these things if eventually they get enacted. Um, we think there's a lot of potential as communities don't really know how to invest the money and that there's a lot of confusion in what to make with that investment. And so we hope that the science that we do could fill a gap there and really help the communities to be positive, to say we want this because the science had supported it. And there's a team of 18 organizations there that have validated this data and worked together to, to provide the best outcome for, uh, for basically taxpayers' money investment. Christina, are you guys able to hear me online? Yes, I am. So this is Scott Collis here. Again, I apologize for not being able to make it today. Uh, just to kind of add to what Christina said in terms of actionable um, community science and how this benefits the community both now and beyond the, the hopefully initial five-year time frame of Crocus, we've actually had a really nice uh, case in point recently with our friends in, from the Greater Chatham Initiative who are going after some U.S. Department of Agriculture funding right now for tree plantings in uh, Chatham. And they are not only using some data we've been collecting, but also using some of our observational approaches to instrument the plantings they're going to make. Um, and we're actively adding text to their proposal for doing this, which actually is again, something that is more action and not just science. And this highlights kind of the way the proposal and the teams have been built with these community partners being integrated with the science team. So while we're collecting the data, they're directing how we collect the data. And they are instantly, because they're embedded with our teams, able to go after those um, interventionist uh, funding opportunities outside of the Department of Energy. Just following up a little bit on the first two questions, have you encountered any pushback as you've been engaging with communities about what you're trying to do? And in particular, there are communities that are resistant to tree planting, you know, mm -hmm. because it's going to spur gentrification. And what so I'm, at, I'm wondering, have you encountered that? And what is your um, approach to consensus building? Have you worked that into your engagement process? Yes. So um, we have, let's put it this way. We had, through our community engagement office, we had a, a number of communities we would work in. So we started working with some of them um, based on the fact of the, the easier way of, 
connecting our, our languages in, and discourse and, and with real interest in, in, in doing some of this work. So there was a lot of work going on at the beginning in actually maturing the, the, the collaboration with these particular organizations. Um, as far as consensus building, that is actually going to come. And, and what we are really testing is the, at this point is really not a, a preferred solution. Um, the idea is taking the inspiration from what they have told us is on their mind to really start providing scientific information to truly assess what that's gonna look like and what it's gonna do, right? So the next step when we are really looking at consensus eventually is when we go to the community and say, look, you we talked about generically planting of trees. And then we go and we can say, this is what you can expect. This is what you cannot expect. And gentrification is really high in people's interest. And it's not just for for, for because of trees is because of a lot of things. So, so that research will have actually, if you have good methods to understand the drivers for, for gentrification and embedding it into our scenarios, that would be wonderful. But the idea is really provide communities with options and they feel empowered to say, this is better than this. I want this rather than that, short-term, long-term, medium-term, whatever it's gonna be. Uh, I want trees now. There's people who say, I love trees because because they shade my street. There's people who say, I don't want trees because they're, ter they're tearing up my curbside. There are, tree there are people who say they break into my, my, my pipes and, and I don't want trees. There's people who are concerned about trees falling on their rooftops and creating a problem. There's also trees that are eventually are concerned about gentrification. So I'm not saying we are not really proposing trees as the best solution. We are saying among all the solutions that you have, this is what you can expect from planting trees. This you can expect to having a bigger park. This is what you expect to putting you know, solar rooftops or something like this. There's a community in Puerto, in Puerto Rican agenda actually would like to have a rooftop greenhouses uh, heated by solar systems so they could actually make their own produce. And so thinking of urban agriculture and things like that. So there's a lot of different things. And so we are not there to, to say, this is better than that. And, and we want to come into a consensus on that. We want to say, provide options and, and examine those options. So it's a little different. So I have a ton of questions, but I'll try to I'll keep to the main ones. So one a comment first is that it seems like one way you can immediately engage the communities and provide something to them, which I think you have already, is by is by education, by enlisting them for helping, enlisting the kids to help you take data, which then provides a vehicle for science education, right? And so that even regardless of what the data is for, that provides sort of an immediate bonus and benefit to the communities. And so, so having a strong educational outreach component of it that really engages scientists and, and, and our own students with the local communities um, does a huge amount for bringing value to the communities themselves. And then, so then my question, which feeds back on that is, um, you know, this crocus has always seemed like this awesome project to start bringing together a bunch of people who have interests in environmental science and the community, um, I can see that you guys have a great team, you know, how, what structural mechanisms will you have to, to pull in people from Chicago, people in this room who've obviously come because they're so interested, you know, like how, how will, how will we, how can you use Crocus to build a wider community interested in sort of the urban environment and environmental science? So, well, there's, there's a lot of answers potentially. Um, if you think of more formal collaborations, okay, of course there will be ways to do that. Uh, the easy one would be joint appointments, uh, you know, that we can work together on, or 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 basically co collaborating on different uh, funding opportunities of different different kinds. That's one. Um, as far as communities, we have a an incredible effort in in in. Uh, in, um, in reaching out to communities. We're gonna have an out loud lecture on Columbus on November 30th. So if you're interested, there's gonna be a show and tell display of you know instruments, tools, models, everything else. And then a talk and panel with our community, with one of our community members as well as others. So we always do these kind of things. Again, working with schools, now we are <laughs> we are going to um, to beef up our, our school. Again, we are still waiting for our IRB approval. So there's limited things we can do now um, with the communities, but uh, with communities and, and with schools because of that aspect. But as soon as we get those those um, those paperwork, the paperwork resolved, we're gonna do more of that and really 
hoping to work with Chicago Public Schools. Actually, one of the, our partners is Chicago City Colleges. And so the city colleges have already started working with their own students to, to work with on some of these aspects already. Uh, going more to the K to 12, they're the ones who are gonna have the, the, the rank ages, for example, that should be connected to a, a better, a stronger curriculum in, in, in climate science um, and making kids you know, knowledgeable about this. So there's different ways that we, we can think of, but but there is, I guess there is no sanctioned way to do that. It's really, at the moment, it's really, what are what is the interest? How can we channel it to some productive way? And then we'll figure out the mechanism to, to do that. Um, again, we are in the launching period of still after a year, I know, believe me, the paperwork that we get to go through mm -hmm. and the organization of, of all this large team was, was really humongous. So, so now we're in better condition to do all these things. Maybe my, uh, Rao, you have other yeah, thoughts? I think the University of Chicago has a more formal way because you are part of this project. Yeah, exactly. But the money is not coming from DOE, the money is coming from University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So I think if you can identify how you want yeah. to use the money, for, mm -hmm. you guys have to build that connection. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not our money. We cannot spend No. No. Yeah, what happened is that when we were writing the proposal, um, this was a tremendously competitive call. We, there were about 42 um, proposals submitted and they selected four. Um, so it was tremendously competitive. And to make us competitive, the university committed some resources to work with us, even though they couldn't really be part of the project itself because the university manages us. And so it was a perceived a, you know, a conflict of interest there. So... So I think I just fill it out to maybe help answer Liz's question. So that pot of money that the university committed is running through Mansueto. Mm -hmm. And so we will, part of the reason we're hosting this and trying to bring people out is to get ideas and interest and expressions uh, uh, of a desire to collaborate. And we would obviously want to make those decisions. It's not a huge pot of money, but it's not trivial. And we want to make those decisions in collaboration with Crocus mm -hmm. to make sure that the things that we came up with are yeah. received as valuable by them. But you know, so from the Mansueto side, we're hoping that this conversation today begins the process of identifying those folks at the university side who would like to collaborate and then you know, just with the understanding that the collaboration is with all these 18 organizations eventually. So there's a lot more than Argon, there's UIC, there is UIUC, many are Northwestern lots. I mean, one one thing you guys should. Seriously, the, the thing we cannot do is building policy handles and economics into this decision framework uh, that we have zero capability at this point. Uh, so it will be very useful, and actually this is the expertise here. It will be great if you can come up with something along those lines. Yeah, terrific. Just to, and also just to add to what Rao said, just before uh, the change in leadership, we had a really nice, um, I think a master's student with Aurora, Cor uh, I'm going to mispronounce the last name, Cor awesome. Coruscant, who was actually taking some of our observations and looking at various health impact indices to try to link some of the data we're collecting to health outcomes such as excess mortality and so forth. So as Christina was saying, that is kind of sits at the edge and just beyond the horizon of Crocus in terms of the mission of the Department of Energy, but definitely of interest to places in Chicago, that kind of link between climate, climate change and human health. Nico. Uh, one uh, question I had is the mayor recently announced that they're reestablishing the Department of the Environment. And that seems like a fine, like fantastic potential partner uh, because I think a lot of the data tools approaches that are Crocus is developing could do uh, inform a lot of the decision making at the programmatic level of that because they're they've announced their top priorities are planting more trees and I think you know any systematic scientific approach for determining where those trees would have the greatest impact would probably be of really immense use to that office as well as programs for doing interventions and improving especially in low income areas like upgrades and retrofits of the housing stock and so have you thought at all about how, or would you even be able to interact or co coordinate with them? And like, have you thought about uh, how that would work? Yes, so we have connection with the city. Uh, we are working through our community engagement, local local government and so on. So we are actually, I believe, scheduled to meet uh, the new administration soon. Uh, so hopefully that will come out. Um, 
historically had a lot of connections through earlier projects that, that Argon had. So there's a lot of history there. Um, and, uh, and just to say, Jared Polisikio, who is the uh, deputy sustainability officer for the city, was actually at our all hands meeting uh, a while back. And so he's aware and actually also I have, I'm gonna meet with him soon. So, so yes, definitely, uh, yeah, I'm following that <laughs> very, very, very closely. So. And CDPH, Haid Mansour, they've been working on this tree yes. thing. Right exactly, years, yeah. yes, yes, and them too. They are also engaged, yeah. Very specific question. Oh, in Argonne, um, all of the instrumentation and data gathering, is, is that all in place and so you're actively gathering? I'm just wondering where you are in this five year mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. So uh, some obviously data collection is, is ongoing from the sanctioned ways that we, we just collect data from. Uh, as far as our infrastructure, we have started to put two of these inst instrument clusters in the, in, the, in the area. We are planning a lot more this year. Uh, and also this year we're going to be we're planning for the summer for these very specific campaigns where we actually get the big instrument for our time. It's going to be a, cer a certain amount of time, a very defined amount of time uh, over the summer. So we are really starting now the, the, the paperwork for that and try to understand what it needs to convince people that a big grader on a on a truck is not going to be harmful. Anybody is going to be looking at the sky and, and nothing else. So so we have all these things too. Though all these steps that are really obviously slowing down. Our progress. We have also some uh, significant supply chain issues with all the electronics. It's been a nightmare. Uh, but now that I've we've got the instruments, so this year we should make a lot of progress because we have the paperwork, we have the, the, the things actually, and, and all that. So hopefully we go much faster. So we are building. We're building that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this is too specific, but you showed on your um, on your maps you were showing surface temperature. So, so my group, uh, I ran a data science project for PhDs students. So we looked at some local, fairly hyper local mm -hmm. temperatures, and we can definitely, you know, we can see that huge effect of trees and vegetation um, on the on the surface temperature. But then the real question is, well, for health impacts, is it the surface that matters, or is it the, you know, the three meter air temperature or something that's higher up? So I don't know how to answer that question without health information. I know the city of Chicago and Northwestern have this big project on, on getting hospital specific information so that they can match that, but it seems like you have to include some kind of health study in order to even understand which environmental variables are relevant. So how do you thread that needle with DOE and are you working with the city of Chicago and Northwestern? You're not not directly uh you know assimilating health health data in terms of how to choose the measurement strategies we are recognizing that surface temperatures are kind of easy to measure from satellite yeah. because a lot of surface yeah. data yeah, exactly. and that's fine that's easy to get you don't need to do much to mm -hmm. do that but that's why we're also deploying uh two meter uh -huh. med stations so to, i mean not with that level of um, granularity, but without actual human height yeah. air data to complement the you know the satellite and surface data. I'd love to talk to you offline about that. I just wondered if the Northwestern effort, the city funded effort, could be a way of answering that question to say we've talked to them about it too, and they have have a real specific. They, they haven't had a full coherent plan for addressing that yet, but they they have to address it, yeah. you know? And so, but maybe if you guide them, they can answer the question that you need. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I, I'm, I'm less sort of familiar with that, that, that city funded effort mm -hmm. personally, maybe others, Rao, you may know more about no, it. But, but we do focus on all the models that you, the reason we are coming down to the street level or whatever, the street scale modeling is to get the two meter bridge. Yeah. Because between the buildings, it is very different from on yeah. a farm. So we need to get to that kind of specifically. And one of the summer studies we'll be doing is probably in an urban canyon mm -hmm. in Chicago, where we'll put a lot of instruments, hopefully, and yeah. not scare people. So that's what we're doing. The health is, data is also super important. Yeah. So we ask them questions also like, well, do you, I mean, obviously, you even if you say, like, I can show that tree planting, like, reduces 
two meter temperature, or maybe the surface temperature is really important. Um, you know, where are people most impacted? Are they impacted at their homes, in their place of business, uh, you know, where they work, you know, what are their migration patterns? Like it, it feeds into all kinds of sociological information that then has to go through health information to then turn into the question of what's what's relevant. And all these people need to work together. Yeah. yeah. But you know, I think I think one of the key things here is that what we are really trying to do is also develop the science of how to do these kind of studies mm -hmm. in a sense, right? The science of how to study an environment, how dense your network has to be for observations, what kind of things are relevant for modeling or not, how exportable this is to other places, you know, how we, the data are going to be dependent on land use, for example, uh, how, you know, there's a lot of questions that really have to do with the, with the nuts and bolts of how you even design science experiments at this level. And so what you are saying fits exactly into that. So at some point, we're going to have the whole column there, and then somebody in the health sciences will, will tell us, the two meter is the one we want, but the four meter is also relevant because of what and the roof temperature and the and the ground temperature connects to, to the two meter based on on Rao's, uh, you know CFD models in a certain way, so you can extrapolate one from the other, and this is you know scientifically demonstrated, right? So so there's going to be a lot of these moving parts that need to be. And I really think Crocus should be kind of seen as the nucleating granule of a lot of this work as well. We already have some people who have been working on various proposals, including at the University of Chicago with the work from Marshani Chetty and Kelly Wagman, who are actually, they got some internal seed funding to look at the human computer interaction component attached to Crocus. So people can bring in, we'll write letters of support for appropriate things and stuff like that, but also by yeah, you know, we're an open science project, so by making the data available, including uh, examples through things like Jupyter Notebooks, I fully expect for the data, both from uh, the measurement campaigns, but the modeling data as well, uh, to be used for very, very interesting science uh, beyond the initial scope of the, pro uh, the project. Um, yeah, one very how have you been building connections and collecting data in suburban and small like areas, especially like smaller municipalities, uh, that maybe the hospitals uh, don't represent, and also getting into a classroom board of choice in the app? So uh, thank you. That's a good question. We are actually meeting with the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus uh, in one of their regular meetings on the 14th. And so we have been uh, interacting now that we have our, our, you know, orientation done this year to really expand that conversation to the sub to the suburban areas, including New York. So, so we're working on that right now, uh, and I, we expect there'll be some differences between that and and what happens in the city. But that's also important too, as we are really trying to understand how this urban bubble, the heat bubble and the CO2 bubble extends over to the suburbs and to the rural eventually. I don't want to stop the conversation, but this is our end of our usual time. So uh, those who want to stay in chat, if Christina has yes, enough time, please do. I want to, first of all, thank you all for, for coming. And, and just to reiterate, yes, Christina said, this is meant to be, you know, the kind of introduction for some of the people to Crocus and the idea of the collaboration between University of Crocus, for which we have some funding. So uh, if you are interested and, and wheels are turning after hearing this, uh, reach out to me or Brian Wilson here at Mansueto. And uh, since we're, we're kind of the repository of, of that funding and in, in collaboration with Christina and her team, we can think about ways to ways to continue to uh, work with you. Fantastic. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah,